Joining us now on the line from Kansas City, Missouri is Nancy Baim. She's an associate professor of communications at the University of Kansas. And Nancy, it's good to have you on our airwaves again. How are you tonight? I'm great. It's good to be back. Well, you know, the funny thing is you and I were just chatting before we went on about the ridiculousness of this conversation because we're about to talk about how things like uh, social media tools have uh, made an impact on how people communicate. And you and I have had three long conversations about these kinds of topics, but always this way. I've never met you. You probably don't even know what I look like. This is kind of silly, isn't it? Well, I, on the other hand, what's the alternative? We don't communicate at all. I'll take it. I like it this way. It'd be I better to be there, for sure, but... I love your spirit of optimism. That's really nice. Let me start by reading something from the Irish Times that Dr. William Revel wrote back. Uh, this is more than 10 years ago. He wrote, technology is natural, and to fear technology is to fear ourselves. We even idealize past technology, such as the steam engine, as having a noble and unthreatening character compared with the technology of today, ignoring the fact that in its time, the old technology was criticized in exactly the same fashion as is the modern technology now. Talk to us for a second here about this fear that some people have about the impact that technology, um, social media tools in particular, are having on the way we communicate. Uh, that's a great quote to start off with. I'm so glad you chose that because it's exactly true. When we look at how people communicated about previous technologies uh, and communication technologies, the telegraph, the telephone, the television, you hear exactly the same kind of fears that people express about the internet. You know, fears of it's not real communication, it's inauthentic, it's substituting for real interaction and so on. And I think, I think those fears are very understandable, but I think that they reflect not so much a concern about the technology per se, but a fear of a fear of losing human contact in general, and I think that that's just sort of a core fear of being a social creature, that being isolated is sort of the, this is what we do to our worst prisoners, right? We put them in isolation. So I think that fear of isolation is just sort of core to our being, and we reflect that fear onto whatever comes along that seems like it might possibly maybe have some effect mm -hmm. on it. So I see our fear as both understandable, but also as um, important to understand. Now, private conversation sense. always had the potential of being private. But, of course, when you're talking about private conversations in social media, you're talking Facebook, you're talking Twitter, and that communication can potentially be much more public. So I want to know whether you think that n aspect of communication, the fact that private conversation can be more public, actually affects the way we communicate with each other now. It does, maybe not as much as it should. Um, I think that often people even if they sort of know that it's public or could be public, we see time after time after time where people post things on Twitter or Facebook that get them in trouble because they just didn't fully understand how public it really was. Um, so on the one hand, I think that it affects it in that people become increasingly innocuous. Like I've certainly noticed over the last several years that the status updates on Facebook are getting vaguer and vaguer and vaguer. You know, they used to be uh, more personal, more meaningful, and now they tend to be things like thinks it was different yesterday than it is today, right? Which means <laughs> nothing at all, but it's guaranteed not to get you in trouble anywhere. So I think that there is a possibly a little bit of a trend toward vagueness, but I think at the same time that public and private are really complex negotiations and that when people are communicating through social media, they tend to be pretty focused on the audience with whom they think they're communicating and less aware of the other audiences around. So even, say, on Facebook, where you know who all of your friends are, you still might be posting something, thinking about 20 particular friends and sort of spacing out that the other 573 or however many others there are might actually hear that as well. So if our conversations online are more innocuous, does that also mean we are inhibiting or restricting very much the, uh, the kinds of topics that we might otherwise get into? Oh, certainly, sometimes. I mean, not always because, you know, like I said, we see so much stuff on Facebook and, and social media that you can't believe people are posting publicly. Um, I have a student who has just done a survey of people about what they think is inappropriate on Facebook. and, and um, People talk a lot about, I can't believe people are saying such racist and homophobic things, and I can't believe people are getting into huge political fights, and I can't believe people are um, talking about their sex lives. So, you know, clearly people are talking about, about all of this stuff, but I do think there's an inhibition factor that goes on for many people. Let's yeah. talk about cyberspace versus real space. And to do that, I'm going to read a quote uh, from William Gibson's Neuromancer, which I think you use in your book as well. And I got to mm -hmm. tell you, if the first quote you liked because it was so perfectly clear about what it was trying to get across, 
we're going to break that trend right now because this one is going Gibson, to take not so much. Lucy, this one's got some splaining to do. So let's let me try reading this one here. <laughs> Cyberspace, a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation, by children being taught mathematical concepts, a graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system, unthinkable complexity, line of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data like city lights receding. That's cyberspace. Okay, Nancy, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> well, one thing to keep in mind about Gibson is that he wrote that before we were using the term to talk about the Internet, and he wasn't talking about the Internet. He was talking about a fictional space that he had imagined, which in many ways the Internet has come to resemble in part because people building the Internet were reading him. Um, but I think what Gibson was envisioning there was the idea of vast networks of data that people would be able to navigate through um, and that's where the city, the city metaphor comes from. Um, so he's talking about an, a space made of information where information is connected to information and laid out in a way that would resemble a physical space and that goes on forever. The, again, the, the re lights receding idea. Um, so this vast, vast realm of information spaces. And if you read Neuromancer, he's, you know, he's, he's talking about um, people who are wearing goggles who are plugged into these sort of imaginary realms where they're having adventures and exciting things are happening to them. And in many ways, it's very, very different from what we are doing when we're logging on to Facebook or Twitter or sending email or the things that we do on the Internet now. And except, say, um, Second Life, That's I think. That's exactly you know, what some I was going to say. Second are... Life would be a good exception to that. Yeah, and I think Second Life is, you know, was built by people who were really interested in Gibson's vision. It's not a coincidence that it's like that. And also online role-playing games, you know, the, the really immersive graphic ones, I think, have, have qualities more similar to what he was talking about. Do you think users of social media see online communication as being kind of separate and distinct from, quote-unquote, the real world? I think they do when they think about it in the abstract, um, because they'll frequently use, the, like, for example, the phrase, in real life. Like, so-and-so is my friend, in real life, um, by which they mean to, to sort of ground that relationship in something other than the internet. But I think that when people are um, sending updates to their friends on Facebook or sending a link or, or otherwise posting to social media, I don't think that they're viewing themselves as having imaginary, artificial, cyber relationships. I think they think they're talking to their friends. But they are Just making like, a you distinction know, when we pick between up the telephone Facebook to call friends somebody, and We don't think, you know, ooh, I'm going to have a cyber encounter through the magic of telephone wires. <laughs> but they are making a distinction between a Facebook friend and a real friend then. People do use that language. They do use that language, yeah. The, or, or they'll say, you know, this person is my Facebook friend because they're also my real friend. Mm -hmm. um, so they use that language, but I think that part of what's going on there is the, the collateral damage of Facebook's choice to use the term friend to signify what that connection is, right? Because we all, if you sit somebody down and you give them their list of Facebook friends, they can go through it and they can say, well, this person's an acquaintance, this person's a relative, this is somebody I work with, and they can delineate what all the different types of relationships are that connect them. Um, so I think part of what people are doing when they say, my friend in real life or, or my real friend as opposed to my Facebook friend is that they're not trying to distinguish between artificial relationship and genuine relationship, they're trying to distinguish between um, a friendship and another kind of relationship. And do you think they should make that distinction? The, I'm sorry, which, which one? The real authentic or the, 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 yes, the real the, friend, Facebook the, friend? The real world from the online world, friendship. Is it important to make that distinction? I don't think so, no, because I think that they're, they're continuous and they're interwoven and, and most of the people with whom we communicate online are people with whom we communicate on the phone or face-to-face -face. and the more close we are to a person, the more likely we are to communicate them, with them through, through multiple media. So I think there are online communications that are fantasy-based and inauthentic and unreal and, and deceptive, but, but I think the overwhelming majority of interactions that happen on the Internet are between people who view one another as real people and who view what they're doing as communicating, not as emulating communication. Let's talk for a second about how people communicate on things like this. I'm holding a BlackBerry in my hand here, and we see all the time people 
uh, instant messaging or texting each other happens on the street. So yes, we live in this real world and can walk down the street in the real world, but we can be someplace else online. And I wonder yeah. whether, whether all of that, you know, whether all of this in the handheld device is distracting us uh, too much from real life. Well, again, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would substitute face-to-face -face life or embodied interaction from real, because I think oftentimes, you know, our imaginary spaces are more real to us than the physical spaces. You know, how many people daydream their way through work to get through the day, and we don't talk about, you know, ooh, they're in cyberspace. Um, <laughs> but I. I think that certainly, you know, distraction is an issue. I don't think there's any question about that. Distraction is an issue, and, and trying to handle multiple things simultaneously is an issue. And, and I think it's pretty clear that when people are texting and having a conversation with somebody face to face at the same time, they're not giving their continuous attention to either one, and probably both of them suffer to some extent, but especially the face to face. So, you know, I'm all for no texting at the dinner table and, and rules like that to, to put these things in their place. I do think it's important when you're with people face to face to be focused on them face to face. But you know, if you're walking home and you'd be listening to your Walkman, a Walkman, who listens to Walkman? You're listening to your <laughs> iPod and you're, or you'd just be listening to the birds or whatnot, you know, why not be having a conversation with somebody? You know, when you said Walkman, you really dated yourself for a second there. You gotta be careful know, of those references. I know, <laughs> Well, as we I'm consider- as young as I look. <laughs> as we consider whether or not this technology <laughs> helps or hurts, I have heard some people say that Social media can be a really positive communication tool for people, for example, who are really socially anxious or who are very shy, for whom this is a mm -hmm. way to bring themselves out. Have you got much uh, evidence of that? There is, there is research looking at that, not my own, but there's, there's um, a woman named, um, uh, I think, Yael Caitlin McKenna, who last I heard was at NYU, who's done some wonderful studies looking at this, really over the long term, so following people for periods of years. And she's found, yeah, that people who are socially anxious who, um, who make a choice to use these media in order to form relationships have a lot of success doing it and that those relationships um, move offline and become face-to-face -face relationships and they last also. They last as every bit as well and sometimes better than relationships formed face-to-face -face. and that those people often take those skills and the confidence of being able to build relationships off so that when they meet people face-to-face -face, they may be less socially anxious. The ability to think about what you want to say, to type it out, to see how it looks, to revise it, those are really important capabilities for people who feel a lot of anxiety when it's their turn to talk. I'm happy to hear about those success stories, but is it also equally true that just having the ability only to have relationships in that other world means that you never actually do develop the social skills necessary to talk to another person who's two feet in front of you? Well, that's the fear, but you know, the research isn't there to support that. Um, I think that's what everybody fears because everybody thinks in terms of either this or that. If you're good at online, then you're not good at offline. And what we see is that the people who are the best online are also the best offline. And the people who, who learn how to build relationships and how to succeed socially online, do that skill does transfer offline. So certainly there are individuals out there who get caught in online spaces and, and don't take it offline. But for the most part, when people meet online, when they form relationships that way, they want to take those relationships into the face-to-face -face world. And then they've got friends in person who they're spending time with, and that's giving them the opportunities to become more socially skilled. So I don't think that that, um, that fear of, oh, if shy people go online or if lonely people go online and they form friendships offline, then they'll never have to go offline. I don't think that's grounded in any evidence of what actually happens to people in that situation. Okay, let me try one more thing in our last minute, and that is I, I suspect whether you're a booster or a critic of all of this new technology, this stuff is fundamentally changing people. That's the suggestion. Do you agree that it is fundamentally changing people? You know, I always have trouble putting technology in a position of having that much power. You know, people have been around so much longer than technology. I think that people are using technology in ways that change us, but I think it's the people doing the changing, not the technology. You know, it's a, it's a catalyst. It's not a causal agent. I gotta believe I was I, a different I do, person you know, before the Blackberry came along. Are, 
I'm sorry, what, what did you say? I, I, I suspect those who know me would say that I am a different person now thanks to the Blackberry. And I don't think they mean it in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> that may be, but, but I would still say that you made choices there. It wasn't as though the Blackberry landed in your hand and it, it did something to you. You made choices about what you were going to do with it and how you were going to communicate with other people and how you were going to communicate with people through that device. I don't think it had some magic spell that it cast over you and you were stuck being victimized by its transformation. I think that you've got more activity than that and you may have changed. I don't, I don't question that people change, but I, I wouldn't want to say it was the Blackberry that did it to you. I would say it was something you did to yourself with the help of the Blackberry. Uh, no, I disagree. There's a secret chip in all of these devices that takes over your brain, and it's happened to me. Anyway, <laughs> Nancy. That could be. If, if that were the case, I wish they could, they could make it so that you could be fluent in any language instantly. I'd go for that, there, too. There's other things they could do. So long as they're implanting chips, they ought to be doing more with them than that. Amen to that. Nancy, it's so good of you to join us again from Kansas City, Missouri. And one of these days, I hope to shake your hand in good old-fashioned communication. Take care. That would be terrific. Thanks.